the candidate with the Institute for Work and Employment Research. And today I'm going to be presenting my job market paper, uh, Crafting Empowerment Worker Issues, Manager Moves, and the Conditions for Frontline Change. Just to set this up a bit, which probably won't be a surprise, um, a lot of American workers are frustrated and are looking to have influence over change within their work environments. You can see this with the recent right to organize and to put pressure on employers to bargain. You can see this with the way that employees are targeting their firms, their industries, even their governments, as well as even workers pushing within their own unions for more democratic decision making. And this bears out with survey research as well. When American workers were asked how much voice they have versus how much voice they believe they should have, there's a clear gap. And these are some of the issues where the majority of Americans feel that there is this voice gap. So you see some bread and butter, benefits, compensation, promotions, job security. And you're also seeing the, some of these other issues like respect, harassment protections, technology values, and ways to improve the work. And so from this, I just want to assert two things. One is that changing a lot of these things is not a light switch. If you have a culture of disrespect, it's not just one quick decision to make changes. And also, there's a lot of heterogeneity across workers and issues and what matters to them. And so given this, I'm really motivated to understand what enables workers to affect their desired workplace improvements. And so one way to do this is inside of the organization. So organizational leaders can create programs to loan organizational rights to workers. And these can be rights like agenda rights, which is the right to determine topics that various members within the organization should attend to. These are voice rights, so the right, the formal right to speak up in certain settings and decision rights, the rights to determine what organizational members should be doing. There are a lot of different programs and, and interventions that, that organizations have been experimenting with. So something like grievance procedures, which can lend a certain amount of rights across these three things, and other interventions like self-managed teams, non-routine listening, like open door policies, or idea collection, like you might see in town halls, which gives workers voice rights and some variability of these other rights. But today, I want to, to zero in on sanctioned groups which gives workers a narrow set of agenda rights, broad voice rights, and some collaborated decision rights. Historically, there were examples like quality circles in manufacturing in the 80s and 90s, as well as other interventions like employee resource groups and off-the-line problem-solving teams. But how effective are these programs? I'm going to draw from two different literatures. One comes from the employee voice literature, a lot of which focuses on what gets workers to speak up, though there have been examples of explaining what happens when workers do speak up and when is there change. And a lot of this has to do with how workers are targeting their voice strategically, making sure that you're having the right timing, making sure that you're targeting the right people who will be open to change, people who have the capabilities to change within their organizations. But this takes a certain stance that the targets, often leaders, are making these binary decisions and are just recipients of voice and so I'm asking what role do higher status actors have beyond just receiving or implementing these ideas? And also there's been a lot of research on these types of empowerment programs, which are often focused on organizational improvements and have found that there are certain factors like complementary policies, like job training, job security, as well as strong collaborative relationships within the firms that can help improve performance. But a lot of ethnographic work that goes inside and looks at the mechanics of these programs have found a lot of resistance. Higher status staff and even workers themselves can reject and not participate in the program so that there aren't necessarily meaningful changes made. And so I'm curious, under what conditions do staff members actually uphold these organizational rights to drive change? 
And as a quick preview of my findings, even though uh, these programs are often targeted at workers themselves, their managers play a really important role to craft how workers can actually use and leverage these rights, particularly when workers might be scared to, to even participate. I'm going to be drawing from ethnographic work that I've done within a hospital system called Coastal Care. This is a pseudonym. Coastal Care is an East Coast nonprofit hospital system. It's a very large employer in their region with multiple campuses and a lot of community clinics in the surrounding area. And there's also union representation for a majority of the workforce. And Coastal Care has these four organizational values that are online, that are all over the walls, one of which being employee engagement. But through third-party employee engagement surveys, this hospital system has learned that they're actually below the national healthcare average in engagement. And all of this in spite of a lot of investments into engaging employees. There's the engagement surveys where you can glean some things that employees might be thinking about, but they've also strongly invested in training, in lean methods and continuous improvements as well as having an idea tracking platform for where workers can put in ideas and track whether or not they've been implemented. But I'm going to be focusing on a newer initiative that was implemented in this hospital system in collaboration between labor and management, which is a department level initiative where a manager and, their, and one frontline worker are encouraged to lead a voluntary problem solving committee, which is specifically targeted for workers to address issues that make it feel hard to come to work. The data, the data and analysis came from participant observation and informal interviews that happened over 17 months. I observed a lot of the program meetings. These were the team meetings as well as broader infrastructure meetings like the, the program steering committee as well as shadowing frontline staff, shadowing the coaches of these programs across different teams, as well as a lot of follow-ups with staff, leaders, coaches, union representatives, while all of these meetings were happening to understand afterwards how they were interpreting what was going on, as well as archiving a lot of presentations, the training and educational and orientation tools, as well as project-related communications. I engaged in abductive analysis uh, and focused specifically for this question on eight empowerment committees that were matched cases. So I have two inpatient uh, departments across two of the major campuses, four outpatient, as well as two non-clinical departments to make sure that what I was observing was not just specific to spaces where there's a clinical hierarchy. And the analysis focused on 28 emotionally fraught issues that came up within these eight committee meetings, coming from making sure that I'm focusing on issues that workers have identified that really make it feel hard to come to work. But these issues also were related to organizational performance and processes as, and flow, so they weren't completely irrelevant for the functioning of the business. And I looked for indicators of change, which could have been completely addressing the issue or even some moderation of addressing these issues and looking for express satisfaction to make sure that these were things that workers felt were meaningful. And so 19 of the 28 issues led to change. And just as a check to make sure that this wasn't, you know, specific issues are just easier to solve or specific departments are just better at this, I found that there was variation in which of these issues and departments were able to make changes across departments and issues, but also within. And so it couldn't fully be explained by the issue itself or the department. And so how and when are workers actually able to influence their desired changes? So one finding, one process that I'll go into in a little bit is this process that I refer to as crafting empowerment that the frontline managers of these committees really had to strategically interact within their departments to make sure that workers could learn how to leverage these new rights. And this managers engaging in this crafting process depended on two things. One is that there had to be some physical proximity to the workflow such that they could understand even their own part of contributing to the problem, but they couldn't have 
prior failure, when managers had some kind of attempt at addressing this before, but had failed, there was this emotional resistance to re-engaging. So the first step of this process is about upholding the agenda rights by prioritizing issues. Man when managers were able to publicly endorse these projects as something that was legitimate for different people of the department to be talking about, that was really important for workers to know that they can actually have these agenda rights. And this, come, this is from one of the managers um, talking about how important it is that to respect the fact that we need to let staff work on the things that they want to do, even though there are things that really matter to her. <clears throat> the next step in the process is conditional upon publicly endorsing this issue is the ways in which the manager was able to center the dialogue. This concept of centering comes from William Isaac's book, Dialogue, which is thinking about an issue, a topic, as being at the center of a circle. And every person that's involved in this issue sits along the perimeter, such that they can really only see their own piece. And by having specific tactics to bring people into the center and look around, and not only express their own concerns, but understand other people's concerns. And so managers, um, when managers were crafting empowerment, they actually played a really active role in talking a lot. There was a lot of synthesizing about what different roles were saying, and a lot of times when they were interrupting specific people as they were sharing stories when they maybe weren't relevant or something that they had brought up before, which might sound like silencing workers, but it was really important to make sure that everyone was speaking and listening to each other. And the third piece of this process was about the manager engaging with the assignments, not just making sure that workers are coming up with their own decisions, but uh, actively engaging in it by encouraging assignments that address root causes. It's really easy to just give demands and say that person should be doing that, you should stop. And so from this dialogue, encouraging workers to think about how they could address those root causes and facilitating some consensus decision making. Workers actually saw managers as a little bit more unbiased because they had to consider all of the roles. And so it was easier for the manager themselves to facilitate consensus decision making and often taking assignments themselves because they might be the most appropriate person to take on a task rather than just expecting workers to do all of the work here. And so this process, this which was iterative, uh, constitutes the, the crafting of empowerment, such that this upon articulation of these emotionally fraught issues, with this frontline manager crafting empowerment, there were changes observed. But then under what conditions does this process happen? And there was one specific issue that was illuminating because it fell across three different departments. One led to change and two didn't. Uh, and it's a great case because uh, it involves a lot of different roles. I'm actually, it's, it's about labs. I would like to get into more, but just for time, I'm gonna skip over the description of the, the problem itself. But like I said, there was one department where changes happened, two where this did not. And so with one case, uh, the manager of that department was something that people would refer to as poisoned by the Kool-Aid, who was scared to address problems and that this was sort of, you know, drinking of the Kool-Aid, that you don't touch some of these issues. And so this manager had actually tried to address the lab order breakdown before, but was resistant to actively encouraging it and trying to bring people together to speak. And then another was a manager who really saw this initiative as their thing, that having an empowerment program was just up to the workers to figure everything out on their own. She was very physically distant from where work was happening. She, she actually oversaw several departments. Um, and I'm just going to stop now. Uh, this, here's the conditions for change. Um, but what I'm hoping we can see is that empowerment is not just something that you give to your workers. It's something that you have to actively craft for them and that it's important uh, to think about who's involved in this based on their own experience with these specific issues. Thank you.